What is Kabbalah? Kabbalah is an ancient Jewish tradition of mystical interpretation of the Bible and Talmud. It was transmitted primarily via storyteller-like tradition and esoteric code, including ciphers. Keep that in mind, that ties into what is termed Cicada 3301 and its cryptological and puzzling ciphers it put forth upon the 4chan message board. Kabbalah's main doctrinal source is the ancient book, the Zohar. In the Torah, the word Zohar appears in the vision of Ezekiel 8.2 and is usually translated as meaning radiance or light. It appears again in Daniel 12.3, quote, Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. Keep this idea of light or illumination in mind as we go forward with this discussion. Although, as a preface, this links to the origins and development of Judaism as it does with Kabbalah itself, and is very much indicative of a Neoplatonic, or the Promethean concept. Prometheus is akin to Lucifer, a materialist emanation who seeks to distort the natural world and destroy the spiritual, via the tempting of man with unwieldy knowledge or power. Continuing on, Zoroastrianism, the Kemetic religion, or the ancient Egyptian religion, Hellenic, Canaanite, and Babylonian religious ideas were heavily borrowed in the development of Judaism. I shall detail this further on. However, bear in mind that what we are seeing with Kabbalah, in terms of its theological or philosophical framings, are not unique to the Abrahamic faiths. For example, Kabbalah is really an Abrahamic rehashing of the Neoplatonic school of thought, in that it sees the cosmos as one's having a perfect and ordered form, of which a chaotic force then infiltrated such a perfect state and brought the world into disunity. Thus, as I will detail in time, Kabbalah seeks to bring the oneness back to the world, the quote, perfect state, unquote, of the primordial light of the infinite, the Ein Sof, as Yahweh, or the Spirit of God, is described within Kabbalah. This is entirely the reason for the dualism existent within Masonry too. Freemasonry, that is. The two pillars, Boaz and Yakin, and the black and white checkered squares, for example. As speculative Masonry is, essentially, an antiquated Gentile form of Kabbalah. Now, we can skip over the Four Worlds concept, as it will not have much bearing upon our discussion of Kabbalah right now, and how it ties into Cicada 3301, cybernetics, and also needlecraft, it would complicate matters further. But I will mention that in the Zohar, the seven lower sephirot, or the nodes of the tree of life, which we will cover soon, are those aspects of God that are present in Asiya, one of the four worlds and our world of action. This links to the principal seven Noahide laws, of which then subdivides into 620 in total, of which Gentiles are to abide by. The three higher sephirot are mitzvah, as there are ten Jewish commandments or laws that Jews should abide by in total, and this symbolises the quote, upper human, unquote, consciousness, or the gaining a oneness with God. These are not for the Gentile though, as they are remarked within the doctrine as possessing a lower quality of soul. Keep at the fore of your thoughts too, Seven and also three are extremely important numbers within this philosophy of Kabbalah. Continuing on, the origins of Kabbalah. Now, before I discuss the goals of Kabbalah, I think it is important to briefly prepare the ground by discussing the origins of Kabbalah and why ancient Egyptian, Hellenic, and Babylonian mythology not only ties into this to a great extent, but shines a light on the inconvenient truth that Judaism wishes to keep under wraps, so to say. That is, at a point in time, pre-captivity or pre-exilic period in Babylon, Judaism was very much a polytheistic or henotheistic religion. The worship of Yahweh alone began at the earliest with Prophet Elijah in the 9th century BCE, and at the latest with Prophet Hosea in the 8th. Even then, it remained the concern of a small party before gaining ascendancy in the exilic and 
early post-exilic period within Babylon, that is. That is typically between the building of the Second Temple, 515 BC, and its destruction, 70 AD. Prior to that, it was largely accepted among the Israelite people to consider the Canaanite god El as the same as Yahweh, hence the word Elohim, which is the plural form of El, as another name for Yahweh and the basis of the name Israel, might I add, which translates to potentially El persists or wrestles with El. Look closely to, as I stated, quote Elohim, unquote, is a plural form of El, which has come to mean a unitary God in Semitic languages, strangely enough. And thus, understand that this maintaining of the plural for God, hence gods, was because the rabbinical authorities were trying to instill unity within the religion during the Babylonian captivity and had to resort to using plural terminology to embody many gods into the one deity of Yahweh. We can see this occurrence contemporaneously within the modern Holy Trinity, and that tradition has continued on into the different derivations of the Abrahamic faiths. This polytheism thus stretches back to the Aburu, where the word Hebrew derives from, as the Egyptians and Mesopotamians pejoratively entitled them, or the Hyksos, meaning the Shepherd King, which was several dynasties of pharaohs. Although, do keep in mind, the history of Judaism, the Abrahamic faiths, is not something I could cover here, as it is an expansive topic and it would take several series. Digressing, however. So this is where Kabbalah comes in. That is from my inference, from the information of the facts of the matter. Now it would seem that Kabbalah was a natural progression in the retaining of the, quote, old polytheistic ways. You see, Kabbalah was historically criticised by mainstream Judaism as being indicative of a dualistic interpretation of God and creation and of worshipping other gods or deities other than solely Yahweh. Now, the critics would be right in this regard. However, they do not understand the roots of Judaism or Abrahamism. For example, quote, In Jerusalem each year, the king of Israel would preside over a ceremony at which Yahweh was enthroned in the Holy Temple. The Hebrew Bible gives the impression that the Jerusalem Temple was always meant to be the central or even sole Temple of Yahweh, but this was not the case. The earliest known Israelite place of worship is a 12th century BC open-air altar in the hills of Samaria featuring a bronze bull reminiscent of Canaanite, Bull El as it's titled, or El in the form of a bull. The worship of Yahweh, Baal, and El would persist for some time concurrently prior to the end of the captivity in Babylon period, where monotheism and the uh, reforms of Josiah would take full effect. Now, the critics were correct, and you see Kabbalah does possess a polytheistic tendency as it worships the goddess Shekinah, of which is a wisdom deity, and encapsulates the primordial light of creation. She has been described as the wisdom of the serpent and the inspiration of the dove. Now, that description really shows an indisputable connection to the Egyptian goddess Maat with her feather of truth motif. If you recall, I did a video on this a while back entitled Crowley, Cicada, and the hive mind, in which I tied all of these seemingly unconnected topics together. Recall we discussed the twin coming eon of Maat and Horus, as Crowley and his disciple Nima explained, which is and was represented by the caduceus, or the pharmaceutical or medical symbol, and in the book entitled, quote, The Cosmic Shekinah, a historical study of the goddess of the Old Testament and Kabbalah, unquote. It states, quote, In the cosmic Shekinah, the authors present a concise history of the different influences of earlier wisdom goddesses on the development of the Shekinah. These goddesses included the Sumerian 
Inanna, the Egyptian Maat, the Greco-Egyptian Isis, the Semitic Anat and Astarte, and the Canaanite Asherah, which ironically Asherah was considered the wife of Yahweh within the Israelite mythology. Continuing on, they show that from these ancient sources, the unnamed wisdom goddess and wife of God portrayed in the Old Testament and early Jewish wisdom literature arose. Hence, we see the illustrated connection here with Matt. This derives from the borrowing of philosophical and theological ideas by the Hebrews in their development of their religion. But it also shows a traceable timeline from modern Western esotericism all the way back to Judaism and the Egyptian pagan and mystery religions. This idea of the divine male and female is contained within the Magan David, or Star of David, the Israeli flag, in that it is comprised of the two interlaced triangles, one signifying the divine male, or Ein Sof, the infinite, or God, and one, the Shekinah, or divine female, as I've stated prior, above. This links to the Adam Kadmon, or Adam Elion, the upper man, or primordial man, desire of Kabbalah, of eventually merging man into God, through man attaining a, quote, collective consciousness, unquote, and becoming a superorganism, much like Heligan's global brain, or transhumanism, which means beyond man. Nietzsche discussed this materialistic, transhuman concept in his work on the Ubermensch, within Thus Spoke Zarathustra. This then links to Thelema and Cicada very directly, in that Crowley, within the Book of the Law, discusses this idea of the Ein Sof, or infinite, and the elevation of man to a higher status in Sen. Quote, Had the manifestation of Nuit, the Egyptian sky goddess, which links to the Ein Sof by the understanding that the Hebrew for heaven, Shemaim, is understood as another representation of the infinite, or Yahweh. He continues on, Crowley does. The unveiling of the company of heaven. Every man and every woman is a star. Every number is infinite. There is no difference. Help me, O warrior lord of Thebes, Ra, in my unveiling before the children of men. Unquote. Moreover, within Crowley's Kabbalistic writings entitled Liber 777, we find the same understandings presented there and prior to his death. He hoped to bring his book into line with the Book of the Law. There is much contained within that book, and it might be the most important book Crowley wrote, even above the Book of the Law, with how he shows his religion, Thelema, ties in with Kabbalah, both theologically and numerologically. An excerpt from that book which states, in conjunction with this idea of the Kabbalistic ideal, of the joining of man and God, and man becoming an infinite collective, or superorganism, hive mind, if you will. He states, quote, The peacock is the bird of Juno, as lady of air, and especially Aquarius, but the peacock might also be referred to Tifereth, or even to Mercury, and Sagittarius, on account of its plumage. The vision of the universal peacock is connected with the beatific vision, in which the universe is perceived as a whole in every part, as the essence of joy and beauty. But in its diversity, this is connected with the symbolism of the rainbow. Keep that in mind, with what's going on now. And also with, um, should we say, the moral unorthodoxy. He continues on. Which refers to the middle stage in alchemical working, very important. When the matter of the work takes on a diversity of flashing colours, this, however, is connected not so much with the nature of Sagittarius in itself as an isolated constellation, but with its position on the tree of life as leading from Yesod to Tifereth. He is referring to the Kabbalistic tree of life there. Unquote. The middle stage of alchemical working that Crowley is referring to is distillation. Of distillation it is said that Quote, the second stage of the greater work, the greater work is this alchemical terminology for, again, the same thing, essentially a singularity, a, a transhuman transformation of sorts, 
continues on, the whitening. Mars dominates the second stage of the greater work. Saturn and Mars are opposite each other, seen in their glyph, where the cross sits atop dominating the crescent of the soul or the sphere of the spirit. Both represent an extinction of sorts. While Saturn symbolises the chaotic condition of death, Mars is an active and directed descent of spirit into the lowest levels of human consciousness. Here the body is completely penetrated by the incombustible sulphur now. Now we can see the use of constellations and other such terminology used here. Do take heed that this is all mere symbology and in a way simply fanciful language for the symbolising of the end goal, the reduction of duality and the creation of a new form of man and the world. I wish to draw your attention as well to the part of the explanation on distillation, that's be in the middle process of the alchemical working, in which it states both represent an extinction of sorts and then goes on to link Saturn with the symbolising of the chaotic condition of death, Mars uh, an active and directed descent of the spirit into the lowest common denominator. However, focus on both represent an extinction of sorts. And then Crowley states that the middle stage in the alchemical working is symbolic of the rainbow. Now we see within the medical industry and even the pharmaceutical industry for that matter, we also see with the various new normals of morality, should we say, the degeneration of our culture of sorts. We see this idea of the rainbow being utilised quite ubiquitously. Is there a connection here? It also states as well in the last line, within the explanation on distillation, here the body is completely penetrated by the incombustible sulphur. Is that a reference to needlecraft? Who knows? However, it caught my attention nonetheless. Continuing on, of Yesod and Tifereth, it is said from a leading modern Kabbalist, Rabbi Yitzhak Ginsborough, that, quote, in Kabbalah, the third day of creation, Tiferet, or beauty, is the origin of the sixth day, Yesod, the foundation. Tiferet and Yesod totally integrate in the secret of the middle line. The body and the Brit, or Hebrew for the covenant, are considered one, unquote. Therefore, we have this elevation of three and six. Now, this could correspond to the number of the beast, that being three score and six, but I believe it goes further than that. If we look at the Baphomet, as drawn by Eliphas Levi, inspirational occultist to Crowley, the Golden Dawn and Theosophy, we find that Baphomet is a representation of the Sephiroth, not of Satan, and one can overlay the Sephiroth and the ten vessels of it can be seen within the various points upon the Baphomet, even having symbolic relation. For example, the pentagram, which is located at the forehead, near the third eye, is the Da'at, which is the preceding stage before Keter, or crown, and it shows the union of both male and female, the preceding stage before the androgynous Adam Kadmon, or Adam Elion, the upper man or primordial man, or pre-fall man. Notice too, the Keter being the pinnacle of the Sephiroth is translated as the crown. It is also symbolised as a fire or a light, that's being illumination and we understand the connection there. However, do recall as well, Corona is Latin for the crown. Continuing on, we see also on the Baphomet, the Yesod and Tiferet stages of the Sephiroth being symbolically depicted as the Caduceus, or the intertwined serpents, one black and one white, which is what we saw from Nima too, and Crowley for that matter, and their Eon of Maat and Horus, the twin Eon, or that being the Shekinah, the divine female, and the divine male, the Ein Sof. It is the same thing as the Adam Kadmon, the pinnacle of the Sephiroth, the Keter. Thus, with what is going on now, and the usage of these various symbols within this event, such as the Caduceus and the Rainbow, I believe that Sephiroth is being utilised as a ritualistic plan for the implementation of the ultimate desire of Kabbalah, that's being the reduction of duality, 
into total unity of consciousness and the creation of man into a godly infinite, a hive mind if you will. 